We talk about the um, first community in the United States. In the West Indies and South America, Spanish and Portuguese and Dutch settlers brought us to those places to work in, on, on the plantations there. There was no slavery in the beginning of Jamestown in the United States. Um, in 1619, uh, we came to the United States. There are different um, stories about how we got there. Um, 1607 was when um, three boatloads of British and I think Irish men came to the United States. They were encouraged to come to the United States. Rich people encouraged them because I think they wanted to get rid of these people. These people were people who were living on the street. They were debtors. They were people who were, had been in, 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 in jail. And I think the um, rich people wanted to get rid of them. And they encouraged them by saying, you know, if you go to this a uh, far off place, you're going to find gold and silver, you're going to get rich. And um, I guess those people who they were talking to said, they might as well go, you know, be better than being here. So they put themselves in, in, uh, in um, indentureship. And three boats, boatloads of them came to what we now know as Jamestown, that area. When they got here, they didn't find gold and silver, they found Indians. And there were a lot of massacres and um, uh, sicknesses and deaths. It wasn't really, it was really terrible. Um, the next year, I think half of the people who had arrived in Jamestown to find a better way of life had died. We arrived in 1619, there were different stories about how we got there. Um, one story is that um, the Dutch, the Dutch is enslaving us now. The Dutch were taking us to Cuba to work the sugar plantations. And uh, they ran out of fuel and food and near the um, settlement of uh, Jamestown. So they went into this settlement and um, you know, said, we have these 20 negroes. Give us food and fuel to go on, and you know, you can have these negroes. That was one of the stories. So they, um, that's what happened. They were given food and fuel to go on, and we became part of that Jamestown community. They said we had indentureship, but it really wasn't. I think with all the people going into this settlement at one time, the British and the blacks, they didn't have time to think over what indentureship meant to us. Because after they thought about it, it was uh, taken away from us. Indentureship meant to the whites that you would work for eight years, you would you'd have to become Christian, and, and then you would um, be able to, they would give you a home, uh, uh, um, land, and, um, you know, you, you, you would be free. And so we, um, that was done for us uh, years, but after they, the people who were making the laws thought about it, they began to think, uh-uh, we shouldn't do this. We're not helping us ourselves for allowing these blacks. They're not really, you know, the people that we want to be a uh, part of our society. So about 10 years later, there was no 10, 11, 12 years later, no indentureship for us. But some of these people had moved out from um, Jamestown to other parts of Virginia. These blacks who had said they, you know, uh, were indentured. And they had land and they had uh, families and they were doing really well. Um, but, uh, and they weren't as affected as the ones that were, you know, living close to that Jamestown colony. Ten years later, eleven years later, 
We didn't have any rights, black codes. And 20 years later, we were um, said to uh, be able to be purchased. They could buy and sell us. And Virginia, state of Virginia, leading the way. Most of these pictures are prints, copies of uh, paintings. All of these are authentic except this one. This is done by a Philadelphia artist, and I don't know about this artist, but these are prints, and all the rest of these are authentic pictures taken during that slavery time. This one, I uh, have that up there because it reminds me of how it probably was when we were put on a block to be sold, this one here. Uh, about a year ago, uh, an African-American woman came in. And she was standing right over there, and she was saying, that is my ancestor there. And he's not going to be pictured like that in, in any museum anymore. She's saying that we, we've gone to court, and we're going to stop it. Uh, so that was interesting, and I haven't read up on, you know, what happened. But she, she was saying, yeah, we've gone to court our family, and, you know, we're, we're going to stop that because he's my ancestor, and we don't want that for him. Uh, this is a print of the painting uh, that Lady Bird, um, one of her historical paintings. It's called Checkerboard Harvest. And it, um, I think it was 1834, when the United States government decided that no more Africans should be coming into the United States. And, and of course, the plantation owners were very angry because they needed Africans to work the plantations, make them rich. And so they um, decided on another form of uh, getting their workers, breeding. They breeded us like you breed cattle. They had, um, like they could take um, a young lady on their plantation who was maybe 12 or 13, um, have her in with a man who was married and happily married in a room. And uh, she would be there until she became pregnant, you know. They would have houses where you could um, go and buy uh, people you know, servants. If you want a biracial woman, pretty biracial woman, you could buy her. Or if you want a big, strong black man, you could buy them in that house. You know, like you go to like Puppy Barn and you pick out your little dog. That's how it was back there. But that was the time of breeding. And they didn't really care how they did it. They had to um, have, you know, the number of people they needed to uh, run their plantations. And this done by Lady Bird, this is evidently the enslaver here. And this could be his mistress. She's light-skinned and she's dressed really nicely. And this could be a young lady just coming from the motherland. You see the hairstyle and everything. And here he is introducing her to his workers and mothers of his children. These are biracial kids, right? And there you see the embryos, biracial embryos. And over here you see the brutality that our people had to suffer, the, the picking of the cotton and the, the beatings. Here's the, uh, the big house, the carriage. And over here is the ships coming in. This is an interesting painting. And this is done by a uh, ladybird, ladybird Shipley. So um, it says here, 1640, Africans coming into the colony of Virginia are denied indentureship. We probably never had it. Those already there and the newcomers are subject to discriminating laws, black codes, and perpetual terms of servitude. By 1705, ch chapel slavery had emerged in Virginia and the other colonies, Virginia leading the way. 1640. And at this time, there were other people coming from Europe, from England, 
They were the Puritans, the Pilgrims, uh, the Quakers coming, looking for religious freedom. They were welcomed by the people who were running these colonies. Um, some of those people went further, stayed in the north, and some people went further inland, south. You know, we, we know about the Quakers, how they helped us um, acquire land and helped us in many respects, but um, they took part in slavery too. In 16, I think it was 68, in Pennsylvania, they decided they would not do it, but they took part in slavery. And some of the Quakers became very, very wealthy in um, one of those New England states. I can't think of the name of the state, but they became filthy rich. And initially, we talked about how the, some of those Englishmen were encouraged to come to the uh, to the United States. It wasn't the United States then, but to this country, right? Um, they thought they were going to find gold and silver and get rich. Some of them did later. And some of them went back to Europe and they left their uh, riches, their plantation, plantations in the home, in the lands of people who did not get rich, right? Uh, those Englishmen who were not successful. And I think those Englishmen or the people who abused us because they were not comfortable with, with what they had accomplished. And these are some of the things they used on us. These are all authentic. The whip, this whip was used on women and children. I can imagine what the whip for men would be like, you know. These are branding irons. This one was used on uh, women and probably put on her face or upper arm. This one is interesting because this one came from the plantation where Michelle Obama's great-great-grandfather was enslaved in 1850. It's Frenfield, South Carolina, Frenfield Plantation. And that's where he was enslaved in 1850, I think that's what it says. This is a shackle, and that's the ball. You know, they talk about ball and chains when you get married. This shackle would be attached to that ball. That ball weighs about 35 pounds. So uh, that would be attached to this, and that, uh, uh, that would, shackle would go around your ankle. You could pick cotton, but you couldn't run too far with that ball. And that was the, that was the purpose you know, to keep you from running. This is uh, like on that print there. It's taken from Atlanta, Georgia. And on the um, front of this, it's written tobacco and niggers. And then it has the names, probably a store, names of the, uh, the storekeepers. And then it has a, um, a Star of David over here. And so evidently, in Atlanta, Georgia, it has the time there, you could go to this store and you could buy tobacco and you could buy niggers, you know? I want, you could say, I want 15 pounds of tobacco and I want to buy those niggers in that store uh, in Atlanta, Georgia in, in 1850. Before we were talking about um, immigrants coming into the, the, the colonies, you know, in the United States, right, being welcomed. Um, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Quakers, all coming around this, this time in the 1600s. In 1659, Burlington City well, was very prominent in Burlington County. Just all from this city is an um, island, a small island. And on that island, in the time period that we're talking, where all these immigrants are coming from the different countries, there were blacks. And those blacks were there under the um, slave, slave ship, I guess you can say, of the Dutch. The Dutch were there with us on that island during this 1600, 1659 time and all these other immigrants coming into the country. 
We were slaves of the Dutch, the blacks. And uh, we weren't there too long with the Dutch. The English came in and I, they said without any fighting, just took over the, 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 where we were, the island. And some of the Dutch people um, who, you know, we were enslaved by went into New York, went further north, New York. And so the English came in, took over the people who were enslaved, some, sent some of them down south. And um, some of our people went to New York with the, um, with the Dutch. And we settled, some of our people were free, um, freed shortly after, and we settled in New York in a place called like, like Soho, you know, that place called Soho in that area when we were freed in New York. That's where we had our first settlement in New York until um, the Irish and the Portuguese came in and pushed us up to Harlem. But Soho, that, um, that area was where um, we first settled in New York uh, under the influence or uh, slavery of the Dutch. Uh, we, timed, we tried to do this time-wise, right? And so we talk, this is pre-revolutionary war. We talk about um, Crispus Attucks, who was the first person killed in the Boston Massacre. He was a runaway slave and was living in Boston. And he was taunting the British sail, uh, soldiers there. And they fired on him and five of his friends. And he was the first one killed. And he celebrated for that. And that's a picture of him. And then this picture is a picture of Oliver Cromwell, who fought with George Washington in the Revolutionary War. And after um, fighting, he was uh, discharged with honors, and he went, uh, returned to his home in Burlington City. The home is still there on East Union Street, intact. But he, he was a hero, a Revolutionary War hero. And then we talk a little bit about in 1793, Eli Whitney invites the cotton gin. The cotton gin is okay, but it um, means that you need more workers. It increases the need for blacks and increases slavery. Uh, Eli Whitney says he didn't, you know, earn any money for it, but uh, it did increase the need for blacks and increases in uh, the slavery thing. This is cotton, and uh, this is the thing that we worked on the plantations, first tobacco and then cotton, from time we got up in the morning to the time we went to uh, bed at night. And we were supposed to produce a certain amount. If we didn't, we'd be beaten. It's a terrible situation. That was this thing, cotton and tobacco. And this is a, a flag, you know, it looks like it's had its last days, but it's a Betsy Voss flag. Uh, in the 1700s, flag. Now, this is something that's really important to me because it explains a little bit how I feel about our ancestors, right? The abolitionists were great because they put their lives on the line to help us. But it was the ancestors that were really something else. You know, they said, you know, I, I've got, I have had enough of this and I've got to get away for myself, for my family and for the children to come. I've got to go. I don't know where I'm going or how I'm going, but I've got to go. And they went. They went. Sometimes they were returned and hung or castrated, but they went. 1837, Queen Victoria of England freed her slaves, freed the slaves in her empire, you know, in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. So they were freed before us, right? And she said to our people, um, come to Canada. 
you know, they own Canada. It, once you get your feet on that soil in Canada, you, you're going to be free, right? So that's what our people wanted. All they could hear was freedom. And they wanted to go to Canada. And some of our people didn't make effort to go. All along the Atlantic coast of, uh, of the United States, our people went. All of them didn't go on the Underground Railroad. They went on their own, right? They built these little um, communities, segregated communities of their own. They hadn't reached Canada, but and they were subject to all of the um, restraints and all of the difficulties that we were subject to here in the United States, you know. Along the Atlantic coastline going up to Canada, they built a large community in Niagara Falls uh, where, you know, they uh, celebrated the same things that we celebrated here, Emancipation Day and, you know, and all of the things that we suffered here in owning land they suffered there in, in Canada. Some of our people came back to the United States when we were freed in 1865, came back, and some of them stayed. This is Harriet Tubman, beautiful lady. This is her when she was about 30 years old. This is a, a picture recently, you know, discovered. Uh, but she was an amazing person. I have a little thing written about her, and it says that she was born about 1820 near Bucktown, Maryland. She completed 19 missions plus her own to escort slaves to freedom. Uh, she helped more than 300 slaves escape, including her own parents and siblings. She worked for the Union Army as a scout and died in 1913 in Auburn, New York. I think she was 92. An amazing person, you know? She um, worked for the federal government when we were um, free and kind of, a lot of us didn't have a place to go. We were stuck like in South Carolina. She was like a social worker, you know, helping with the food and clothing and stuff. And after she uh, finished that, she had to fight or not fight, but she had to persuade the federal government to give her her pension, you know, after all that stuff she did, um, fighting in the Civil War and everything else. She finally got the money, and she went up to Auburn, New York, beautiful place, and she purchased a, a, a land. And on the land, she built a house, a hospital, a church. And she said to our people who were still stuck in South Carolina, if you don't have a place to go or if you're not all right, come by me. That was something, you know? And, and she really meant it. Uh, I was uh, visited home about four years ago. And uh, it's a beautiful place. The federal government national park system has taken over the site now, making it better, but I don't see how much better they can make it because it's really, really beautiful. It's something really to see. This is a picture of her when she was about 30 years old, which is really, really great. Around this time that we were talking about Harriet Tubman, um, the federal government issues the Fugitive Slave Law, and that is terrible. That's a law where the federal government assumes primary responsibility for capturing and returning uh, runaway slaves. Federal government on the side of the slave owners, you know. I'm going to get your property back. We're property. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to make sure that those people who've stolen your property are going to be punished. Federal government says that, right? So that's the time, too, when a lot of our people go to Canada. And that's the time when the Underground Railroad is used quite a bit, you know, to get our people uh, wherever they are, uh, um, out of the United States, up into Canada, where we're supposed to have more freedom. This is a sculpture of what I think a maroon looks like. The maroons, I haven't found any of our history books who talk about the maroons. But the maroons are African men who refuse to be enslaved. These are men who are taken all over and they fight the system 
South Carolina there in the hills. And on evenings, they would come down from the hills, go on to the plantations, burn down the plantations, take the people up to there uh, where, where they are living, right? In um, Brazil, there is a community of their descendants it's, that's still there in Brazil. In Haiti, they're the ones that help Toussaint free the slaves in Haiti. They're all over, but they're not included in our history books. You know, you've heard of the uh, uh, Rasta, Rastafara. That's their history. They're the forerunners of the Rastafara. In Jamaica, they're the ones who defeated the um, um, whites in Jamaica and uh, freed, you know, the, the people who were enslaved in Jamaica. The Rastafara, Rasta. Okay, this is a map by Michael Siegel from Rutgers University of the Underground Railroad in uh, New Jersey. And it tells a lot. Perth Amboy was really active as a, a terminal um, or dispensing point, I guess you can call it. Um, New Jersey is really interesting. Even after we were freed, there was a group in New Jersey who uh, would kidnap our women and children and would take them to Perth Amboy, Perth Amboy. And in Perth Amboy, there were boats that would be there waiting for them to load them up and take them back down south where they would, you know, work on those plantations again. In New Jersey, right? New Jersey was really something else. New Jersey also had, I have an, an, um, what they call a colonization society. And um, that, those societies were all over. And they were um, organized to send us back to Africa, mainly to Liberia, right? And this colonization society, we have the man, name of the man and everything, um, uh, tried to get us to go back to Liberia. You know, we're going to send these blacks back. All the Europeans are coming in, but we're going to send these blacks back to Africa, right? We've got enough of them, four million of them, right? Uh, they bought, they purchased land in Liberia, thousands of acres of land in Liberia, and purchased a boat. <laughs> Wanted us to get on the boat to go back, but evidently it wasn't successful. And so I don't, I, I'd like to do some research to find out what happened to that land. But that would be interesting to find out, you know, what, and, but Lincoln was always talking about colonization. I want these people out of the country while welcoming Europeans, you know? Yeah, I want these blacks out. But it didn't happen the way that uh, he wanted it that they can go to South America, they can go to Africa, but just want them out of the country. Over here, we, um, these are things that are done by um, Africans who are enslaved in certain places. This is what they call sweet grass basket made out of grass. And this one was made in 1860 in a little town called Mount Pryor, um, South Carolina. And this little blurb talks about how the people in this uh, place now, most of the people who used to make these baskets are deceased. And the young people don't want, around, want to sit around making baskets, you know. So these baskets are very scarce and very costly now. They're very beautiful. And these are um, grave markers taken from a Savannah, Georgia plantation. And these were crafted by slaves, people who were enslaved. I don't know what they're made out of, or those marks at the top, they look like they're Adinka symbols, but I'm not sure. We did everything on the plantations, you know, build the houses, the furniture. We did everything on the plantation. Over here, we talk about resistance to slavery. I mean, the Underground Railroad was one method of resisting slavery. Uh, but before we um, started writing our own narratives, Europeans 
wrote the narratives for us. And they always talked about how we loved being in this country enslaved, how we didn't want to go back to our native land, but we loved being here enslaved. So when we were beginning to write our own narrative, we denied that. We didn't know our own country, but we denied it. What we started writing about liberty, and uh, some of these people over on this wall here were people who uh, uh, wrote about and acted to get the, the freedom and the liberty that they, they wrote about. There was David Walker. He was from Wilmington, North Carolina. Amazing person. And he uh, was born free. You took the status of your mother. If she was free, then you would be free. And when he um, was about 24 and found out what he had been born into, he decided, you know, I got to get out of this place because if I don't, I'm going to kill somebody or somebody's going to kill me. And um, North Carolina was really, really bad as far as slavery. So he um, leaves and he goes north, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., and he begins associating with people who writing, are writing their narratives. And he feels now that he has a writing skill. He ends up in Boston near the waterfront, and he sets up this place where he mends clothing and articles for people who need their clothing mended, right? But that's just the setup. He begins writing what they call Walker's Appeal. And his appeal is to black men, um, those who are free and those who are still enslaved. And he writes, he reminds me of Malcolm. He's saying, you gotta get off, off your butts and you got to rebel, you got to fight. These men are uh, uh, raping your mothers, your, your daughters, your sisters. You know, you got to get up and do something about it. He only not writes about rebelling, but he writes about a little of what's happening in the society at that time. There are a lot of interracial marriages. Our history books don't talk about that, interracial marriages, right? But he talks about it, so I know that it's probably there. And he's talking to black men now. And he's saying, you know, if you want to marry interracially in a white woman, go ahead. He says, but I, no, it's not for me. And he says, if you do, I hope that you marry a woman who's going to treat you really, really mean. Because after all you, we've been through, you know, you, need, you, you deserve it. He talks about the president of the time, at the time, Thomas Jefferson. He says, Thomas Jefferson says we're beasts, but it's he and they that are beasts. Thomas Jefferson accuses black men of, what is that, bestiality? Where black men have intercourse with uh, animals. Thomas Jefferson accuses black men of that. It's in the history books, and so he, he talks to you know about Thomas Jefferson about that, but his main um, message is about rev revolution. You got to revolt. You just can't take it. So there are many black sailors at the time, and he's by the water. They know what he's doing, right? With this um, Walker's appeal, they go into his place, you know, where he's he has his appeal all written and he sews his appeal to their sailor jackets. And when they go down south on southern ports, they take this appeal out and they give this appeal to the people who are working on the ports, black men. Some of them can read, not many, because of that law that restricts our you know, learning to read and write. But some of them can read and write. So he gives those appeals now, he's a revolutionary, right? He's an enemy of the United States government. He is murdered in, a, in a Boston. Somebody kills him. And I, you know, the government probably murders him by poisoning. But if you read what he writes, it's so amazing at the time, you know. And we haven't been taught to read and write, but this guy, it's amazing. Walker's Appeal, David Walker. And then over here, we have Toussaint Louverture. You know him from Haiti. He is the one that started the revolution in Haiti. Then there are two of his friends later 
um, who pursue that and they free Haiti from the, the French. That rich French country makes the Haitians play restitution for the freeing of its slaves. That's why Haiti's so poor, you know? Uh, France says, yeah, I, we needed those people to work and now you, you free them, so you're gonna pay for it, right? And that's what happened. Rich country of France made the poor country of Haiti pay restitution. I don't know whether they finished it or not for the freeing of its slaves. Uh, and this of uh, Haiti was the first country to free its slaves. It wasn't a Brit it wasn't a, a white country, it wasn't a European country, it was Haiti. Haiti was the first country to free its slaves. That's amazing, isn't it? And they're poor. All of these European countries, hands all, the United States, hands all over Haiti, you know. And I heard recently about how some Haitians were sent back to their country recently. Did you hear about that? No. You know, immigrants sent back to their country recently, I guess a week ago, so ago, you know. When you're supposed to send people back if their country is organized or doing okay. But the United States sent these Haitians back to a very poor country, still a lot of uh, stuff going on there. Um, you've heard of Nat Turner. Nat Turner was one of their uh, rebels. He um, staged rebellion that uh, killed um, 60 white people. And um, after that, the white people were really, really all upset because it hadn't happened before. And they said, now we have to, you know, take guns to bed with us, you know. First I thought, well, maybe they would consider freeing us after that. No, for a little while they did, but then they, um, decided, now we're gonna take care of it. And they killed a lot of black people because of, you know, his uh, rebellion, Nat Turner. That was amazing, you could read that. Um, one more person here. This is, he's called um, Denmark Vesey. Denmark Vesey was a slave of a person called Captain Vesey. We don't know too much of his background, but he was, um, a slave when he was, since he was really, really young, right? Like a cabin boy, and he grew up with Captain Vesey. When he was about 24, a story goes, Captain Vesey decided to settle in South Carolina and uh, Denmark with him. Now Denmark uh, um, made an idol out of Toussaint. Denmark had been in, uh, in uh, Haiti, you know, with within his travels, and Toussaint was his idol. And he said, if uh, Toussaint can free people, slaves in Haiti, we should be able to free our people here in the United States. So that was always on his mind, like an obsession. Um, when he was about 24, he played the lottery in South Carolina, and he won, um, I think they said $1,600. Now he's a millionaire, right? He gives eight of it to his enslaver. Now he's free. He's very cosmopolitan, can speak several languages. He knows how to make furniture. He has a couple of wives, and he has all this money, right? So the man is, the man is on the ball, right? And near where he's living, there is a, a church, um, a church that is served by both blacks and whites. And um, the blacks get excited because they feel that the uh, whites have um, done something to them, have taken away some of their, the land of the church. You know, it's, it's a segregated church. So they said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be in this church anymore. So they go to Denmark Vesey. He has all the money, right? And they asked him if he could loan them money to build their church, and that's what he does. He, they buy the land and they build the church, and he, he starts building his army. 
to overthrow the, the government of the United States, starting in South Carolina. One of his members, members of his army, is still enslaved. He goes to his master and talks about what's going on in the church. So the master calls out the militia, and the militia gets, you know, people super near the area where the church is. They burn down the church and they arrest um, uh, uh, Denmark and 30-something of his, uh, his members. They hung, they hanged them, right? No more church for these niggers, no more Jesus, you know. But in the interim, I think the blacks kept the property that the church was on. Burnt down the church, but they kept the property. And they built another church called Emmanuel AME Church. And that church was the church that this young white guy went in three years ago. Roth, I think his name was. You remember that? Went in there and killed those nine people when they were um, in um, worshiping. That was that church, Emmanuel AME Church, the church, same church that's involved with this that I'm talking about. So history has, you know, connect history with, you're connecting history with that. With that. So that's amazing. This talks about the Underground Railroad and how um, running away was a form of protest. And the slaves from the South entered New Jersey by way of the Underground Railroad. Some of them did reach Canada. Most were males between ages of 15 and 30 who traveled by foot, horseback, wagon, stagecoach, and at night guided by the North Star. These passengers were hidden, fed, clothed, and allowed to rest and cared for at each station, which could be a house, church, or store. Uh, New Jersey, an integral part of the Eastern Corridor of the Underground Railroad, received fugitives mainly from uh, the Atlantic coastline states of Georgia, Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. So that's where mostly uh, the, the, the people that we helped uh, came from, those states. <laughs>